The central claim of the Christian message is that Jesus rose from the dead, a real event in history. There is good evidence that his tomb was empty, that his body really had gone, and that his followers saw him alive again after he died. However, sceptics often point to discrepancies between the accounts of Jesus rising from the dead in the different Gospels. For example, the names of the women who discovered the empty tomb are different. So what are we to make of these discrepancies? The first thing we need to recognize is that differences in the Gospels, even if they're contradictions, do not uh, discredit the account. For example, when the Titanic sank, there were survivors, eyewitnesses, some who said the Titanic broke in half before she sank. Others said, "Uh uh-uh, she went down intact. Well, no one turned around and concluded that the Titanic didn't sink. They just said that there were some peripheral details for which we didn't know. Whenever you look at any documents about any account, whether it's last weekend's football match, if you read three different newspapers, or whether it's um, the career of the Emperor Augustus, if you read Tacitus, Suetonius, Phileas, Paterculus, and Augustus's own autobiography, you find that there are things which don't quite square. Interestingly, when you read the historian Josephus, who, as I said before, was writing in the last quarter of the first century AD, Josephus writes an autobiography in which he tells stories about his own life and so on, but he also figures in his own account of the Jewish war. And when you put those together, they don't quite match. Because in the ancient world, as actually often in the modern world, people arrange things differently, people highlight things differently. There has been a modernist myth, really, since the 18th century, that if something is genuinely historical, it must be possible to tell it as though there was a video camera sitting there on the street corner, recording absolutely everything and giving you exactly everything that happened all the time. That's not actually how real history is done. Some people have pointed out that there are discrepancies and inconsistencies uh, in the resurrection narratives when you compare the accounts in the four Gospels with each other. While these might be of concern to someone who is working out the theological implications of a doctrine of biblical inspiration or inerrancy, These are of no concern to someone who is investigating the gospel simply as ordinary historical records because these kinds of discrepancies are found uh, universally in ancient historical records and no one therefore throws the baby out with the bathwater. Um, Having studied this myself, I think that we can explain some of the discrepancies by laying things alongside one another and saying these happened in, in, in chronologically, so it's not that the women didn't go there and Peter and John did go there. They did, but they went in a different. They went at different times. So if we lay alongside the, the accounts of one another, it is possible to reconcile them. For some reason, people are very interested in why there are some differences. There are often very slight differences uh, in the resurrection accounts, such as how many angels are at the tomb. Um, And you know what, all four Gospels, it's either one or two. So it's not a very wide margin. And sometimes people say, well, what were the names of the women? Well, guess what? Three of the four Gospels give indication that they're not trying to be uh, exhaustive. For example, Luke chapter 24, verse 10 is where the women are named. And Luke specifically says, among the women who went to the tomb were these three. No one, three of the four Gospels, John says we, so in other words, he's not caring to tell you the name. Mark, in just a few verses before the empty tomb narrative, is where they watch the body get buried, and he says, other women with them. And Luke specifically says, other women with them. So my first response to the, the charge that there are contradictions is that they can be answered. They're not the kind of things, I mean, one doesn't say one angel, and one say 20, and one say 42. It's something like that. It's one or two. And if I'm talking to a person, or if my student is talking outside a class and says, uh, the professor said this, and I responded, well, maybe that was in a discussion in the class with five other people. They don't say five people were talking, they just say, I'm talking. As long as it's an accurate comment, we allow that kind of thing. That happens all the time in reports, newspapers, journalism. So I, my first response is I don't think these, these accounts are good examples of contradictions. Many of these details can be resolved by understanding uh, many of the literary conventions of Jesus' day. For example, time compression. 
So Luke's, in Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, Jesus' resurrection, all the appearances and the ascension occur on Easter. Whereas in John's Gospel, it happens over a period of time, uh, weeks. So which one is it? Well, it's probably as it was reported in John's Gospel. Because what Luke does is time compression, telescoping here, uh, whether he's running out of space and he wants to do it for purposes of economy, or he's using a theological point to say that the church seat is going to be in Jerusalem. We don't know why, but it's not a contradiction because Luke obviously knows that the resurrection appearances and ascension, that the resurrection appearances occurred over a much longer period of time because in the sequel to Luke's gospel, Acts chapter 1, Luke says it occurred over a period of 40 days before Jesus' ascension. So it's not at all a contradiction. You just have to understand how the ancients wrote. For instance, in the accounts of the Gospels, um, when we get Jesus on the night he is betrayed, uh, sitting at the Last Supper, and then telling Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times, um, then what happens in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John, is that the sequence of events doesn't quite fall out the same, so that when you put them side by side, the only way you can harmonize the account of the cock crowing and of Peter denying Jesus is if you say that the cock actually crowed nine times. Um, some writers a hundred years ago tried to do that, but of course what you then result in is saying, well, all the gospels are really true because we can harmonize them, but actually none of them say the thing which we now know actually happened. And when you get to that point, we really ought to throw our hands up and say, Don't be ridiculous. This is not how uh, ordinary historical documents work, um, just like it isn't how uh, accounts of anything work, whether it's the account of the Solidarity Movement in Poland or the account of the overthrow of apartheid in South Africa. Different accounts come in differently, but that doesn't mean nothing happened. So with the resurrection stories, um, from from Mark 16, which many people think was the, the first one, it's not absolutely sure, but likely to be, through Matthew 28, Luke 24, and then the much longer accounts in John. There are several different things. For instance, in Luke, all the appearances seem to take place in and around Jerusalem, and in quite short order. In John, you get some in Jerusalem and some in Galilee. In Mark, Jesus tells the women that he's going to Galilee and the disciples will see him there. So when we put it together, it looks as though there are some appearances in Galilee, some in Jerusalem, but then we say, well, wait a minute, Luke's whole focus in his gospel is on Jerusalem and on the temple because he's showing how Jesus is fulfilling those great traditions to do with the temple before then in Acts the message goes out into the world. So yes, Luke has schematized it. Luke hasn't told about Galilee appearances. He doesn't need to. The fact that the accounts are not exactly the same actually points to them being truthful and not to being fabricated. If we were to have four different accounts of a robbery taken from the perspective of four different people and they were absolutely identical with no discrepancy whatsoever, we would assume that those four witnesses had got together and pre-planned what they were writing. So the fact that there are minor divergences between these accounts, I think, points to the truthfulness of these four witnesses as witnesses to the events. The, the idea was not that everyone should have said the exact same thing. If they'd done that, we'd have just said, well, they're all colluding. They've all just copied it from one another. What we actually have is something much more like, and many, many people have argued this, much more like eyewitness testimony in a court. Any lawyer, any judge will know that if there's a road accident or some terrible incident, a murder or whatever, everyone who's seen it will tell the story slightly differently. The memory plays tricks. It was a blue car. No, it was a red car. No, it was coming this way. No, it was going that way. But that doesn't mean nothing happened. And it doesn't mean the witnesses are lying either. It just means that hum human memory does various things. And then when people tell stories, they arrange the material in a different way. And that actually should give us, instead of confusion, should give us four different angles of vision on substantially the same event. Even if there are minor discrepancies, this is just what we expect from historical accounts. In fact, the differences indicate that the writers didn't collude with each other. And many of the apparent discrepancies can be resolved when we understand the accounts better. In these programs, we've seen that there's good historical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead and that none of the alternative explanations work. Next time, we'll ask our contributors what difference 
This makes to them personally. 